I want to share some scripture with you this morning. Since you haven't heard it in a while, I'll read it to you. And there was in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were scared to death. Oh, I'm sorry. Sore afraid. <clears throat> and the angel of the Lord said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You'll find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. I want to talk to you this morning about suddenly. Suddenly. Think with me about that night near Bethlehem. The fields that surrounded the the town of Bethlehem were prime grazing ground for uh, sheep and the shepherds had been grazing their flocks on those hills for hundreds and hundreds of years. And you know, it was another long, boring night out on the hillside. Shepherds were sitting around their fires, probably bemoaning Roman taxes, fussing about low wages, Hard work, nobody respected them. Being a shepherd was the worst job in Israel. Nobody aspired to be one. Nobody really wanted to hang around them much. Certainly nobody wanted to help them. So it was a light night just like every other night. Another day, another night on the job. Another boring night. But suddenly, Suddenly, in a blaze of supernatural glory, the angel of the Lord appears with good news. A Savior has been born down in Bethlehem. If you go down, you'll find him. He's not in the best house. He's not in the uh, prestigious side of town. He's not in the inn. Not anywhere that you would expect He's in a manger. So, suddenly, the shepherds go down, and of course they find the baby. And the Bible says they returned glorifying and praising God. And they made known abroad the saying which was told them. Think about it. Suddenly, they were no longer concerned with taxes or low wages. Suddenly, the night wasn't boring anymore. Suddenly, they weren't really concerned about people's opinion of them. They came back. They'd had a heavenly visitation. And they were changed forever. Suddenly. We serve the God of suddenly. Now, you may not think that. You may think that, boy, he, he takes his time. In fact, the scripture says, they that wait upon the Lord. But let me tell you, when he moves, he moves suddenly. There was a time in my life when I kind of felt a lot like those shepherds. I'd been doing the same old routine it seemed like forever. All I wanted to do was complain. I was miserable. And like shepherds, nobody wanted to be around me either. And I don't blame them. Life seemed pretty hopeless. And the sad thing was I was helpless to change it. Now, the one that uh, came to me with good news was not an angel. It was just somebody that loved God. It was a human messenger. Somebody that really believed. But when he came, he said, I've got good news for you. God is real. He doesn't hate you. He's not mad at you. 
He loves you. Jesus paid for your sin. He took your punishment. And you can have a new life because of him, if you'll ask. Now, I wish I could say I was like those shepherds that dropped everything and ran down to Bethlehem to find the Savior. But I was much too stubborn for that. So I didn't. I didn't go immediately. In fact, I waited till I was more miserable. Waited till I was more hopeless. Waited till uh, I couldn't stand it any longer. So uh, suddenly one day, I just cried out to him and said, if you're really there and if all this stuff's the truth, then I'll be glad to give you my life because I despise it. And suddenly, everything changed. You see, being born again is not a so slow process. It's a suddenly. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. And behold, all things are become new. And I can guarantee you that's the truth. Because suddenly, suddenly, I felt forgiven. Suddenly I had hope. Suddenly I had peace. And suddenly I had joy. And I want to tell you, if you're here this morning and you kind of feel hopeless about life and nobody can help you and nobody wants to be around you and you don't have any peace in your life and what use is life living God has a suddenly for you if you'll just ask we serve the God of suddenly it may seem like he's not even aware that you exist it may seem like he's not hearing any of your prayers and isn't concerned in the least but let me tell you something don't give up you keep crying out to him, and when the time's right, suddenly it'll happen. If you remember what happened after Jesus rose from the dead, he was with his disciples, and he taught them for about 40 days after he rose from the dead. And he told them he had, to, had some more news for them. And they were absolutely certain, absolutely certain that he would now set up his kingdom. They knew in a, that any minute he was going to march into town because he was impervious to death. I mean, hey, after all, he'd been crucified. He'd been buried for three days, and now he was alive. And not only was he alive, he could do things that weren't happening before, like he could just appear in a room without coming through the door. He could be in one place, and then he could be in another place. Man, talk about a king. So they were convinced. And they said, Lord, is it time? Is it now that you're going to restore Israel's glory? Are you going to assume the throne? He said, well, he said, I do have some news for you, but it's not that. I got to go back to heaven. You know, that, that probably didn't set real well. Because they, I mean, think about who this was and what he had done and what he could do if he just got on the throne. I mean, nobody could stand before him. But he said, no, I'm, it's, not, it's not time yet. And I'm going back to heaven. But listen, don't panic because I'm going to send somebody else. I'm going to send another comforter. So he ascends back into heaven. And the Bible says about 10 days later, they were they're gathered together. And suddenly, Acts chapter 2 says, suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the room and it looked like fire sitting on their heads. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to go out and they began to tell people the good news. They began to share what had just taken place. How Jesus had risen from the dead. How, how everything that the word of God said about him had been fulfilled. And how there was salvation and how there was forgiveness and eternal life and all these things. And that God wasn't mad at them. He wanted to save them and he loved them and he paid the price for their sin. And people start getting saved. 
because suddenly that promise came to pass. And I just want to stop here and just add a little parentheses. I've heard people say this, meaning well. I've heard people say that the reason that the Holy Spirit was poured out is because those people were all together in one place in one accord. No, the reason the Holy Spirit was poured out is because Jesus said it was going to be. He told his disciples, he said, now don't leave Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high, until the promise of the Father comes. Not many days hence, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And you know what? If they hadn't been together in that room, if they'd been somewhere else in the city of Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit would still have been poured out because Jesus said it was going to be. It wasn't because that they were together in one accord. It was because it was time. And you know what? God's about to pour out his spirit again. Not because we're all together in one place, not because we've got everything right, not because we're so holy or perfect or anything else, because he said it would be. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And that's not some excuse for us to just do our own thing and go off and live like the devil. But it's going to happen because he said it would. Not because we're perfect and righteous and holy and all this stuff. It's going to happen because he said so. Anyway, so all these guys are suddenly filled with the Holy Spirit and suddenly all fear, suddenly timidity, suddenly bashfulness is gone. And they're not afraid of anything and they go out and they begin to tell people about Jesus. And on that first day, 3,000 people got saved there in the city of Jerusalem. When I had my heavenly encounter, when I became born again, I would have conversations with the Lord and I'd say this, Lord, I love you and I want to do things for you. I'll sing for you, but now I don't want to do anything else, which meant I don't want to preach. So uh, he let me sing a little bit. And I thought I was, I thought that's great. You know, I could, I could deal with that. The truth was, I was timid and bashful and I just did not want to speak in front of people. Now, that, I realize that might be kind of hard for you to believe, but it's the truth. I really didn't want to get up in front of a crowd. If I was behind a guitar and, you know, other people were with me, I didn't care to sing a little bit. But, man, the idea of standing up and talking to people just, bleh. I had not any desire, and I told him so. I'm sure he got a laugh out of that. <clears throat> so a little time went by, and I happened to go to a series of meetings where the evangelist was talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Lord began to deal with me about that. And I said, Lord, I'm saved. I don't need anything else. He said, yes, you do. There's stuff you need to do, and you need this. And I wasn't like the shepherds again. I didn't run and say, Lord, I want this. I resisted. I said, Lord, I no. Mm -mm. And finally, God said, listen, do you trust me or not? I had to stop and think about that for a minute. Do I trust him or not? So I said, okay, I trust you. So I went to the altar, and I said, I, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And suddenly, suddenly the, the power of God, the joy of the Lord came in. And from that moment on, I wanted to talk to people about Jesus. In fact, we'd be singing, and I'd talk so much between songs these poor folks would say, are you going to sing or preach? Well, anyway, if you're timid, if you're bashful, if you lack courage to testify about Jesus, just ask him to fill you with the Holy Spirit. And you'll be like those disciples that said, we can't, we can't help but tell you about what God has done. 
In fact, Luke 11 and 13, quite familiar scripture. But it talks about, you know, if we being evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will our Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Here's the thing. You want everything that God has for you. Why would you not want something that God has for you that would just bless you and give you power and, and give you joy and, and all that stuff. You see, he's your father. If you're a child of God, he's your father. And if those of you who are fathers know that you give your children things that will bless them and help them, you don't give them something that's going to hurt them if you're a real father. And that's the way God is. He's only going to give you something to bless you and to draw you closer to him. So ask him to fill you with the Holy Spirit and watch what a difference it makes. Suddenly, suddenly you'll want to tell people about Jesus. When the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost and all those 120 people emptied out and they began to go around and tell people about the good news, about the Savior, about redemption and salvation and forgiveness and eternal life. A real enemy to the church rose up. That enemy was a man named Saul. Saul was a prominent leader in the Jewish faith and he felt that Christianity was just a terrible threat and he wanted to stamp it out because he really believed that Judaism was the only way to go. And he set out to destroy everything and everybody that had anything to do with, with Christ. Of course, you and I know what happened. As Saul's on the road down to Damascus, he had an encounter too, didn't he? Acts chapter 9 and verse 3 says, As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And if you're familiar with the story, he heard a voice that said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul, <laughs> I can imagine how his voice sounded. It was probably pretty weak. He said, who are you? And the voice said, I'm Jesus. The result of that suddenly was the church's greatest enemy became the church's greatest ally. And that enemy of the church was deemed fit to write over half the New Testament. Why am I telling you that? For one reason. If you've got somebody that's a thorn in your side, if you've got somebody that's an enemy, if you've got somebody that doesn't know the Lord and you've been praying for them, don't give up. Because God's got a suddenly for him. Can you imagine this man that was so vehemently against the, any, anything to do with Christ suddenly is transformed. And the one that denied and persecuted becomes the one that preaches the gospel. Suddenly. God moves suddenly. Don't ever give up praying for somebody and, and somebody that's against you and somebody that's against the church, don't give up on them. Don't hate them. Because the reason they're that way is because they don't know who you know. The reason they're that way is they don't know what you know. They don't have the Holy Spirit that's causing them to understand the things of God. Because you see, as Jesus told Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. So pray for them. Pray for that suddenly to take place where Saul became Paul. And that person that's giving you a hard time or that person that's so lost can suddenly be somebody that's sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. God moves suddenly. Paul and Silas, Paul that was Saul, 
Paul and Silas, not too long later, are going around and they're preaching and they're teaching and they go to the city of Philippi. And in Philippi, they're sharing the gospel with people. And there's a girl, the Bible says that's possessed with the spirit of divination. In other words, she was a fortune teller. And here's another parenthesis, don't, don't fool with that mess. Fortune tellers, tarot cards, Ouija boards, horoscopes, none of that. It's a door to let the enemy come into your life. And listen, if you have a door, he'll come through it. So this girl belonged to some businessmen, and they charged money to have her tell people's fortunes. Now, sometimes we, we have the wrong idea about the occult. Sometimes we think that it's just a myth or a fairy tale. And we think about our horoscope as just something funny and amusing to read. And we think about fortune tellers as just, yeah, right, you know. The Bible said she was possessed with a spirit of divination. A demonic spirit had control of this girl. And there are things called familiar spirits that know things that we don't. And they can see what's going to happen somewhat in the future because they know what they're going to do. So she was able, to some degree, and we don't know how much, to sort of tell fortunes. And people paid to have her do that. But when Paul and Silas came to town, she started following them around and she couldn't help saying, these people, these men show us the way. They're telling us about Almighty God, which was the truth, but she did it constantly. And it became a, an irritation and it came, uh, became a distraction to the message they were trying to preach. So Paul turns around and says, in the name of Jesus, come out of her. And the demonic spirit had to come out. Because the word says that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. So she lost the ability to tell fortunes and because of that, nobody was paying money. The businessmen had Paul and Silas beaten and thrown in jail and locked up. And then about midnight, instead of complaining and saying, God, why'd you let this happen to us? They began to pray and sing praises. And then there was a suddenly. Suddenly an earthquake hits the prison. Everybody's chains fall off. The doors fly open. And everybody is just so amazed at what's happened. Nobody moves. And the jailer sees the prison wide open and he's ready to commit suicide. Because he knows what's going to happen if his charges have left. Paul yells out and says, don't do that. We're still here. That probably really flipped him out. Here's the prison door standing wide open and ain't nobody fled yet. And he comes in and says, what do I have to do to be saved? Suddenly God moved. Suddenly God moved. <laughs> Most of you have heard that account of that mission trip when we were in Cuba and we were out in the park singing and preaching and we get arrested and taken down to jail. And as we're being processed, we started singing and praising the Lord. And suddenly, they said, we've made a mistake. Go back, and sing and preach, get out of here. I wasn't inside. We were still out in the waiting area where we were singing. But the one that was being processed came down and said, you know, when you all started singing and praising the Lord, the guy that was filling out paperwork's hands started shaking so much he couldn't write. Didn't see an earthquake, but things got shook up. Amen. Suddenly, God moved suddenly. I want you to realize that things change. We may think that we're in a rut. We may think things are always going to go on just like they are right now. But God moves, and he moves suddenly. So if your life isn't what you want it to be, if you kind of feel hopeless and like you're doing the same thing over and over and over and you don't know what to do about it, what you do about it is go to the one who moves suddenly. 
Go to God. Go to Jesus. If you feel like you're too timid to share the gospel, if you feel like uh, you don't have the nerve to stand up and tell people about Jesus, go and ask him to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Suddenly you'll not be timid. If you're facing some kind of an impossible situation, God has a suddenly for you. Just like Paul and Silas, praise and worship instead of complain. And watch what God does. If you're kind of distraught and feel hopeless about the future and things look bleak, remember this. God's still on the throne. Everything is taking place right on time. And there's a suddenly ahead. See, there's a suddenly for every one of us. And I was thinking about it. One of them I was thinking about is over in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 12. Behold, I come quickly. Another way of saying suddenly. My reward's with me to give every man according to his work as his work shall be. You see, it may seem like this world's just going to keep going and going like it is. And it seems like that evil is just getting worse and worse and we're spiraling down, you know. But it's not going to continue. There's a suddenly just up ahead. Suddenly, the Lord's going to return. In fact, the word tells us that in the not too distant future, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. The voice of the archangel, the trump of God, dead in Christ will rise first and then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord and then he said comfort one another with those words and it's going to happen suddenly in fact 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 51 and 52 tells you how this is going to take place Paul said I'm going to show you a mystery a secret something that hadn't been revealed We'll not all sleep, but we'll all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Amen. It's not going to just keep going. Suddenly, God's going to come, and we're going to be transformed. So remember Bethlehem. Remember that night that was just like every other night. Shepherds were doing the same thing they'd been doing for hundreds of years. Sitting there around those fires, fussing and complaining, talking about how tough life was, wishing somebody would do something about it. And suddenly, everything changed. And the fact is, Suddenly, everything can change for any one of us if we'll just come to him. When the shepherds had their heavenly encounter, they immediately went to Bethlehem to find the Savior. And today, if you don't know him, it's the day to go meet him. Because life's not going to continue the same right on. Things are going to change, and they're going to change suddenly. Make sure you're ready. Would you stand this morning? Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you that you're a God that does new things. In fact, your word says, behold, I do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. And Lord, you've got something new in mind in your plans for every one of us. Life's not going to just keep going the same on and on. And Lord, I know that there's a suddenly coming that we all want to be ready for. And that's the moment when you step out, the trumpet sounds, and you say, come up here. Lord, we want to be ready. We want to be right with you. We want to know that we're saved. Our name's written in the book of life. We want to know that when that moment comes, that we'll not be left here, but we'll be with you. And the only way we can know that is if we do as the shepherds did. 
run to Jesus. Lord, I pray for every person in this room and if there's anyone here today that's not certain about their relationship with you, that doesn't know for a fact that they've been born again. Lord, let this be the moment that suddenly they surrender and suddenly they're transformed. That weight of sin's lifted off them. Suddenly there's forgiveness and suddenly there's hope and suddenly there's joy and suddenly there's peace. And it comes when we surrender and ask Jesus Christ to be our Savior. This morning while our heads are bowed, if you're here today and you don't have that hope in you and you're struggling at this moment and you want God to suddenly transform, as our heads are bowed this morning, would you just lift your hand in his presence and say, God, I need that suddenly right now in my life. I want to know. I want to know that I'm saved. Lord, I know if we'll ask, we'll receive. Father, I pray for every person here this morning. And Lord, when we feel powerless and when we feel timid, Lord, what we need is more of your spirit. And God, I pray that you would fill every one of us to overflow in this morning so that we would speak the word of God with boldness, so that we wouldn't be ashamed to go and to tell people about the good news that God loves you and he has forgiven your sin and he's paid the price. He's taken the punishment. And what he wants is you to put your faith and trust in him and he will receive you with open arms. God, let us be filled with the Holy Spirit that we are be bold and that we would go out with the anointing of the Holy Spirit on us and lead people to Jesus. Lord, for people that are struggling with relationships, for people that have unsaved loved ones or friends, family, husband, wife, whatever it is. The word says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved in your house. Lord, don't let people give up praying for those on their heart that are lost. Those that may be the enemy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Help us to remember Saul who became Paul. Suddenly there was an encounter with God and everything changed. Lord, let us keep praying and believing. And Father, don't let us be hopeless as we look at the situation in the world, as we look at how things are declining all around us. Help us to remember that you've promised to pour out your spirit in these last days. And it's going to happen because you've promised it. And it's going to happen suddenly. And then as we look into the future, we know the day is going to come when everything will change because suddenly you're going to step out on the clouds and say, come up here. And we're going to be transformed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And God, I pray that you just cause your people to rejoice knowing what is ahead for every child of God. And it all is true. And it all was made possible by that night in Bethlehem when suddenly a multitude of heavenly hosts were praising God on the hills and saying, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior which is Christ the Lord. Lord, let us be like the shepherds and go to him and give our life and our worship unto Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for your blessing, your mercy, and your amazing grace. And God, I pray that your blessing would be upon this congregation. Go with us now in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 God bless you. Have a wonderful Lord's Day. If somebody needs prayer, I'll be glad to pray with you.